some sound therapy. We're going to do some dance therapy. And then we're going to do some reading about the human magnet syndrome and why we love people who hurt us. And I believe we are on chapter seven, I think. Um, and this is um, what we left off yesterday. So emotional manipulators are typically neglectful of their, ch their child's basic emotional needs as their narcissism prevents them from truly understanding and knowing how to unconditionally love and nurture their children. Their narcissism hinders their ability to re re reliably and regularly make their child feel important worthwhile and valuable as their parenting style is selfishly geared towards their own personal and emotional needs. If the child should rebel against or refuse to comply with their parents' self-centered, selfish, and rigid parenting expectations, he is at risk of abuse or neglect as narcissists are acutely sensitive and reactive to disappointment. In the case of the emotional manipulator and codependent parents, the codependent is often unable to protect to protect the child from the harm caused by the emotional manipulator, although substantially more nurturing and sensitive to their child's emotional needs. The codependent parent's ability to offset the damage perpetuated by the emotional manipulator is limited, as they are typically powerless to protect the child and, for that matter, anyone else in the family. As a direct consequence of the emotional manipulator and codependent parents' psychological limitations and or disorders, the child is likely to follow their dysfunctional footsteps. Additional information about the codependent's role in the development of codependency or an emotional manipulator disorder will be presented in the end of the next chapter. Emotional manipulators create future codependence. Yep. <laughs> The emotional manipulator parent holds fast to a fantasy that by having a child, his life will be completely transformed. Because of their inherent narcissism, they believe that the manner in which they parent their child, whom they believe will be a perfect cherub baby, will prove to their friends and family that their critical and unfair judgment against them has been wrong. If they create the perfect child and are the perfect parent, they believe that they will finally prove to the world that their real value, um, they believe that they will finally prove to the world their real value and worth. Since emotional manipulators are fundamentally shame-based, self-loathing and anxious about being lovable and appreciated, they rely on their child to make them feel competent and worthwhile. The child is consequently burdened by the responsibility of validating and affirming their narcissistic parent. As a consequence, the child is deprived of developing a healthy identity as they are forced to become an extension of their parent's damaged ego. The child becomes the salve for the emotional manipulator's festering emotional wounds. The emotional manipulator parent mistakenly believes that by bringing a new life into the world, he will be able to heal his own childhood wounds and right the wrongs of his own traumatic past. The child is therefore unreali unrealistically saddled with the responsibility of undoing or healing his parents' own psychologically damaged childhood. Although the emotional manipulator envisions giving his child the support and protection that he never received, he is rendered incapable by virtue of narcissism. Although this parent believes in the one-dimensional fantasy that love by itself will be enough to raise a healthy child, they are thwarted by their own lack of insight and psychological abilities. Their dream of becoming an unfirming, nurturing, and loving parent sadly never comes to fruition. Paradoxically, this parent unwittingly transferred their own dark, insecure, and unstable past into their innocent and unprotected child. Consequently, as a natural burden is and a natural um, consequently, an unnatural burden is placed on the child of an emotional manipulator to behave in a manner that will make his parent feel better about himself, because it is impossible for any child to fulfill the emotional manipulator's child rearing needs and fantasies. The child is naturally subjected to stress and anxiety early in his life. 
to emotionally cope with his parents' narcissism, the child will attempt to adapt to his parents' interactional style and emotional needs, which are neither natural nor developmentally appropriate. If the child is to successfully adapt to his parents' narcissism, he will need to be experienced as a pleasing and accommodating child. This child's successful adaptation will merit him praise and conditional nurturing as he is able to help his parent believe that their parenting fantasies are real. Codependency is ultimately forged from the child's efforts to independently secure conditional love and attention by pleasing his emotional manipulator parent while also maintaining the fantasy role which was unfairly consigned to him at birth. The child who can make the parents feel good about themselves and conforms to their fantasies is likely to be the recipient of praise and conditional love. The child who cannot or will not conform to his emotional manipulator's narcissistic needs will be subjected to much harsher and possibly abusive treatment. The delineation between the development of codependency versus an emotional manipulation disorder is simply the child's ability to make their narcissistic parent feel good about themselves. Alice Miller, in her book, The Drama of the Gifted Child, describes the unique emotional bind of the child of the narcissistic emotional manipulator parent. Dr. Miller used the term gifted child to describe children who are able to cope with their narcissistic parents' selfish, self-centered and reactive parenting by developing convoluted, although effective, coping strategies. According to Dr. Miller, the narcissistic parent is an emotionally, is an is an emotionally immature and psychologically damaged individual who uses conditional and manipulative child rearing practices to fulfill their self-absorbed and selfish needs for attention, validation, and acceptance. Children of narcissistic parents survive the harsh realities of their formative years by fulfilling their parents' one-dimensional parent-child fantasy. The gifted child who could coax their narcissistic parent into wanting to care for them would have been cared for adequately. To encourage their parents to nurture them, it would be required that the child avoid triggering their parent, not be disappointing or become a personal or emotional liability to them. Intuitive children, or as Alice Miller termed, gifted children successfully adapt to their narcissistic parents' harmful conditional parenting by developing accurate and reflexive protective responses. Since the parent, especially the mother, is the child's sole source of survival, the child strives to please, fearing disapproval or abandonment. Thus, the child sub- sublimates his needs for the parent. Roles reverse, and the child frequently takes on the parent's responsibility as emotional caregiver. This impedes the growth of a child's true identity and a loss of self. Frequently occurs. The child adapts by not feeling his own needs and develops finely tuned antenna, focus intensely on the needs of the all-important other. Dr. Miller described that as early as infancy, the child of a narcissistic parent intuitively understands and adapts to the parent's narcissistic needs and expectations. The infant learns to regulate his own needs to the back burner his his unconscious mind in order to maintain a contrived sense of psychologically psychological equanimity because of the child's learned sensitivity and adaptation to the idiosyncratic and often unpredictable highs and lows of the emotionally unstable narcissistic parent he is able to create a sense of predictability safety and ultimately emotional self-sufficiency Although this child is essentially denied basic feelings of security and safety as the narcissistic parent's needs are always more important than his, he still benefits from the conditional forms of love and appreciation that he is given. uh, Emotionally manipulative parents are motivated to care for their child because he makes them feel good about themselves. The Narcissist Pleasing Child Learning to be a pleasing or gifted child secure the lion, secures the lion's share of their parent's positive attention. Because this child elicits positive attention from others, he will serve to make his parent feel joy and pride. This agreeable, likable, and adorable child will naturally in, 
engender praise from others, especially because he is showcased like a trophy. As a compliment magnet, the gifted child ultimately serves as an extension of his parents' wounded ego and battered self-esteem. Ultimately, this child is sub, sub, subsumed into his parents' ego as everything he does reflects back to his parent. Instead of being the child who is wonderful and lovable just because he is, instead, he becomes a valued acquisition or trophy of sorts that proves to others their worth and value. Since a child is considered a natural extension of the emotional manipulator parent, there is, there is little difference between compliments about the parent's looks, a piece of jewelry, her car, or her adorable and talented child. All are treated as objects of the emotional manipulator. Hence, the pleasing child's individuality is absorbed into the emotional manipulator's insatiable need to bring attention back to herself. The child who is fated to become a codependent will likely be a low-maintenance child who reflexively and consistently behaves in a manner that makes the emotional manipulator parent feel whole and incompetent. The gifted or pleasing child is born into a world that requires him to put his adult parent's needs over his own. After all, making his emotional manipulator parents feel good about themselves is the best way to guarantee that his basic needs are met. Successful adaptation, therefore, requires this child to learn the conditions, although not entirely predictable, that will ensure his parents are content and superficially happy with him. The child who is destined to become a codependent learns early on that conditional love is much better than no love at all. He also learns the inherent risk and disappointing the emotional manipulator parent as he has witnessed others who have disappointed and angered his parent and consequently became the recipients of his parents narcissistic rage the choice between his parents love and adultation oh, and adulation versus their wrath and abuse is clear for this child he has much invested in perfecting his pleasing qualities Future codependents develop an instinct for how to behave in order to be perceived as exemplary children. They quickly learn the advantages of staying true to their projected pleasing or gifted persona. They become the child that is always gratifying or pleasing on cue. Maintaining the identity of the fantasy child guys requires them to betray themselves. For example, they smile when really wanting to cry or calm when frightened comply when they want to rebel and behave affectionately when angry and resentful. Pleasing gifted children must be careful to not be too boastful or showy about any part of their pseudo self esteem. If they should accidentally take the spotlight away from their emotional manipulator parent, they might be subject to their parents' resentment, embarrassment, shame, or anger, all of which are part of a narcissistic injury. It is therefore a challenge for them to walk the very fine line between providing the narcissistic parent with bragging rights while not threatening their shallow and unstable personality. Narcissistic injuries. The pleasing gifted child has a great deal riding on his ability to respond quickly and accurately to the emotional manipulator's rapidly fluctuating emotional states. If this child should miscalculate and disappoint or even worse embarrass his parent he is likely to trigger the parent into a narcissistic injury and consequently witness or become a victim of his or her fury a narcissistic injury occurs when a narcissist or an individual with one of the emotional manipulator personality disorders perceives a situation or direct communication to be threatening and harmful Narcissists are extremely sensitive to criticism or, or intolerance or of anything perceived as less than perfect performance. Often the reason for the narcissistic injury is benign and unintended, but the triggering incident is unconsciously and reflexively registered as a threat to the narcissist's fragile self-esteem. From the injury comes an intense and aggravated expression of rage, which is commonly known as narcissistic rage. In the aftermath of the MPD person's meltdown, he will often feel an extreme resentment towards you for causing him to lose control. He may even shut you out for a period of time, refusing to speak about the incident again. Narcissistic rage occurs on a continuum 
from aloofness, expressions of mild irritation or annoying to serious outbursts, including violent attacks. To avoid triggering a narcissist's injury and subsequently becoming the target for the emotional manipulator, parents' narcissistic rage, the pleasing, gifted child develops a finely tuned radar that quickly and accurately picks up on potentially dangerous emotional situations. This is no ordinary tracking system, as it is so finely tuned that it that it detects the most subtle shift in an emotional manipulator's emotions or mood, from the barely detectable or disguised to anger or rage. The child's ability to predict and consequently avoid his emotional manipulator parent's rapid emotional shifts is precisely what saves him from being hurt, neglected, or abused. Predicting the parent's moods, identifying their triggers, and staying under the radar staves off humiliation, deprivation, and potential harm. By acutely focusing on the needs of his emotional manipulator parent and later other narcissists, this child learns that he will be safe from his narcissistic parents, damaging emotional ups and downs. He will learn that his needs will never be as important as those of his emotional manipulator parent and other narcissists in his, li in his life. To manage the radar system and emotionally survive his emotionally manipulative parents, the child must learn to split off from his feelings. Without this split, the child would arrive at the emotional reala realization that he is not worthy of unconditional love and inherently lacking in importance and, in val and value. Experiencing the full breadth of his feelings such as humiliation, fear of aggravated harm, rage, or hopelessness would be too big a blow to his young and fragile mind. And therefore, by pushing these feelings, thoughts, and memories into the, subcon into the unconscious mind, or repressing emotionally ev evocative events, the child's mind defends itself from what is unable to manage and process. Rep repression is an unconscious protective strategy or defense mechanism that protects the human mind brain from the the delirious the 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 effects of trauma. Defense mechanisms. The term defense mechanism was coined by Sigmund Freud in 1894. Defense mechanisms safeguard the mind against feelings, thoughts, memories, or even incidents that are perceived as dangerously stressful or anxiety provoking. Defense mechanisms are the human mind's trauma defense system. They protect a person from fully experiencing trauma by reducing, disguising, redirecting, or artificially eliminating it from the conscious experience. These defense or shielding strategies work because they safeguard a person from the trauma itself or from the experience of humiliation, fear, rage, shame, or even suicidal thoughts. All defense mechanisms share two common properties. They often appear unconsciously and they tend to distort, transform, or otherwise falsify reality. In distorting reality, there is a change of perception which allows for a lessening of anxiety with a corresponding reduction in felt tension. Defense mechanisms are analogous to circuit breakers. When an electrical system is threatened by a power surge or, it's, or is overloaded, the circuit breaker is triggered and consequently diverts or stops the dangerous electrical surge from reaching its destination. The specific electrical device Without this automatic protective process, electrical devices can or damaged or can be damaged or destroyed or even worse. Dangerous electrical fires can be ignited. The dangerous surge of electricity would be analogous to a traumatic event or memories of past trauma. Defense mechanisms automatically and reflexively respond to dangerous levels of psychological energy. Example, a traumatic event that is perceived to endanger a person's emotional survival. For both the electrical and psychological fuse breakers, the circuit will only come back online when the energy source has been lowered to bearable levels. The energy transferred to a safer place or when the system can tolerate the spike of the increased energy load. In other words, individuals who rely on one or more defense mechanisms to protect them from trauma past or present will only consciously experience the trauma when it is safe for them to do so. Reliance on defense mechanism is useful to, to all of us, but there's a price to pay. Although they help buffer and protect a person from trauma, 
The accumulation of repressed material memories often results in a subsequent mental health condition or psychological disorder. Like marble stuffed in a glass container, a time will come when the container will break. Post-traumatic stress disorder is the most common of these possible disorders. The, the, the development of codependency or one of the emotional manipulator disorders is also connected to the chronic need and overuse of defense mechanisms. Yes, 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 yes. Because when you are dealing with, when you, when you are a narcissist, you are always trying to gain the upper hand to have power over people and control over people because you fear love because of the hurt that you experienced in your past, right? You don't have an open heart. You are actually living with an armor closed off. Like your heart is being closed off and you can't really open up yourself and trust anybody else because it's constantly replaying in your mind of what you've already experienced. And this is the truth of the matter. Uh, although a lot of people don't want to admit this, when you love someone, genuinely love someone, it is going to hurt. You know why? Because there's a lot of things that are going to trigger you. But as long as you have a healthy partner, right, and you guys are able to work through those triggers, then you grow and become healthier together. But when you constantly have somebody that's trying to be, you know, the empower to try to gain control whether that be mentally emotionally spiritually um physically sexually or financially then it's because they don't trust they they don't trust they can't open up their hearts you know and defense mechanisms actually keep us from love you know you I was just saying that this morning, you know, like, yeah, you can, you can try your best to stay away from somebody you love or what you love or, you know, somebody that genuinely may be healthy for you, um, by not, you know, by keeping a wall up, you know, but then you never really receive what you truly desire, you know, so sometimes you just got to surrender and and trust and and know that nobody can truly break you once you have cultivated that and that's why I teach about self-love and building your confidence because once you have done that for yourself nobody can break it because guess what even if you give your heart to somebody right and they prove to be wrong you know like they they prove to be somebody that you you made a mistake or I don't even want to say you made a mistake because I don't think love is ever a mistake right you put yourself out there you give this person your heart and they I guess disappoint you and it doesn't work out you know how to rebuild yourself again you know how you know how to be confident in your own self. Like you're not dependent on them for your self-worth and your confidence. And yes, it may hurt if it doesn't work out, but guess what? You know how to you know how to to stand back up again, right? And that's why it's so important for you to learn how to love yourself cuz and that was in my own personal experience that I looked outside of myself and when you're constantly looking outside of yourself, abusers see that. <laughs> Emotional manipulators see that. And they build you up simply to break you down because it gives them pleasure. That's, that's something that gives them pleasure. You know, and, and a person that's truly genuine and loving and loves you is not going to benefit off of your pain right sometimes pain is necessary to for growth I mean actually pain is necessary for growth but there's a there's a pain of somebody intentionally wanting to see you broken down busted and disgusted and a pain 
that truly wants you to thrive and live healthy, right? Um, and be the healthiest version of yourself, right? Because a lot of those defense mechanisms are not helping you. They're not. Like, you are missing out on experiencing a healthy love because of past events. You're missing out. And, and the one who really loves you is don't want to change you. You know, they just want to show you your unhealthy habits, mindsets, patterns, and behaviors so that you can heal that because it's holding you back from experiencing that, that, that love that you truly desire. So below is a list of defense mechanisms. Repression. Repression. Pushing uncomfortable thoughts into the subconscious. Sublimation. Redirecting wrong urges into socially acceptable actions. That's masking, right? Let me look up sublimation. I believe that that's masking because, you know, it's socially accepted to drink, right? When, um, when you are stressed. It's socially accepted to smoke a joint or smoke a cigarette when you're stressed or it's socially accepted to participate in casual sex right yeah so to divert the energy of from its immediate goal to one or more acceptable social more you know um so that's socially accepted right it's that's socially accepted right it's not socially accepted to sit with your emotions without masking them. You know, that's not socially accepted. Um, denial, claiming, believing that what is true is actually false. Unpleasant facts, emotions or events are treated as if they are not real or don't exist. If you, if you are in denial about anything in your life, if you are in denial about your actions toward other people, if you have not uh, accepted responsibility and accountability for your part in a, a failed relationship, you will never heal. You will never heal. Because accountability and responsibility allows us to become self-aware. It allows us to stare at ourselves in the mirror. But denial is an attempt to cover up and you can't you can't heal when you're trying to constantly cover up. You can't heal when you're masking. You can't heal when you're repressing. You can't heal when you're sublim sublimating. Displacement, redirecting emotions to a substitute target. That's gaslighting. <laughs> That's gaslighting. Well, if it wasn't for you, no, no, no. Yes, people can trigger us. Yes, they can. But ultimately, it is our responsibility to figure out why they are triggering us. What is still in us that needs to be healed for them to continue to trigger us? It's nobody's fault. Can somebody's actions make you feel a certain way? Absolutely. But again, it all stems from childhood trauma. And you got to figure that, that stuff out within yourself, baby. Why this person constantly has the ability to trigger you and cause you to react in negative ways. Nobody, nobody should be able to, right? And it takes a lot of learning. I have been guilty of that, of reacting, you know? Actually, this morning, you know, I had an incident where I had to step back and not react, right? Because nobody should have that power over us, not even our children. And whether we choose to believe it or not, when our children see that they're able to cause a reaction out of us, they use it, you know? And this is why I say, like, you know, you love is recognizing your own power, even when it comes to your children, and still being able to love your children without them eliciting a, ne a negative reaction from you. Is it, is it going to be easy? Hell no. Hell no, especially when you're, you know, dealing with teenagers and, and, and children who need that reaction or want that reaction, you know. But when you can transmute that and alchemize that into love instead, 
<laughs> they don't they 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 realize you know um in, intellectualization taking an objective viewpoint projection ooh that's a good one attributing uncomfortable feelings to others oh my goodness man oh man oh man do we project so much in our society oh my goodness and again that's you know you you made me do you doing this made me do this no no Mm -mm. you know when you when you are a healthy person you can say you know because of your actions i felt this way you know um ras rationalization creating false but credit credible justifications <laughs> reaction formation converting unconscious wishes or impulses that are perceived to be dangerous into their opposites suppression painful frightening or threatening emotions memories impulses or drives consciously pushed out of awareness conversion mental conflict converted to a physical symptom example a surge a soldier terrified of battle developing paralysis blindness or deafness with no medical cause regression giving up current level of development and returning to an early, earlier level fantasy retreating into a dream world of times past or changing the focus of a current stressful or anxiety provoking thought process into unreal or fantasized thoughts the child destined to become a codependent will go to great lengths to perfect to perfect their pleasing and gifted persona out of necessity they become superb actors in their own life and so like you know this is why it's so important, especially with our children, that they are allowed to express their emotions. You know, like I do this with my child, you know, um, and when, when she's angry, she may say a cuss word. And you know what? I don't say nothing because at that moment, that's how she's feeling. And I want her to acknowledge all of her feelings. You know, um, there was there was a day last week where she I think I told y'all this where she was having an an emotional moment and I heard her crying I was in the living room and I heard her crying and I went in there and I said you know are you okay and she was like no and I was like you want to talk about it and she was like no and I said well can I give you a hug and she said yes so I gave her a hug I let her cry out because at that moment when I hugged her she just she just broke down and. You know, I did, I did go back in there at like, it was like later on. Cause I think I had ended up, um, going to wash or something like that after. And I was like, um, you know, I started asking her, is it about this? And she was like, can you just leave it alone? So I had to leave it alone. Right. Um, and sometimes we do, right. Sometimes all a person needs is just a hug. Sometimes they don't want to talk about what is ailing them at that moment what what the emotions are stemming from sometimes all they need is a hug but an emotional manipulator wants to know right an emotional manipulator has to know why are you crying because a lot of the times they think or they make it about them and and god forbid you know their child is upset with them because then then the abuse comes you know then the alienation comes and we in order to raise emotionally mature children that turn into emotionally mature adults we gotta let them even if it's you know like like i tell my daughter like if you mad at me i let me know you know like and I allow her that space without retaliation because her feelings are valid. Sometimes I might piss her off. You know, like a lot of the times I do annoy her. Like we go, you know, when I'm dropping her off at the, um, when I'm dropping her off to go to school or whatever, you know, it's, and I, I am, and I know I am because I'm going to sing early in the morning. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm, half the time, I'm going to make everything out of a damn song. You know what I'm saying? So she like, oh my goodness, it's too early for this. You know what I'm saying? And yes, in her mind, it is too early. But I, I will be like, uh, 
Aaliyah, it's never too early. Like, it's never too early for a dumb song, you know, but in her mind it is, you know, and I might be annoying her, and that's okay. It says nothing about me or who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm still gonna be me. That doesn't change me, you know, but yeah, allowing our children, our partners to, you know, feel their feelings is so important because that's a safe space, right? We're creating a safe space for them not to, you know, not to go off on them because they're crying or because they don't feel like talking or, you know, whatever they're going through or we hear them cussing. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we did that. You you forget you was a teenager? You did that. You know? So, you know, as long as she not cussing nobody out or using it to bash somebody else or, you know, like, allow them to feel everything that they're feeling. They need that. Um... By becoming believable, emotional pretenders, they were able to manage and to some extent control their narcissistic parents' emotional fluctuations while also getting what they needed from them. By successfully feigning or repackaging their real feelings, this child survived her dysfunctional childhood. This gifted child endured substantially less emotional trauma than the child who could not or would not successfully fake his way out of harm's way. The gifted child, therefore, will likely become an adult who effectively and at times effortlessly pretends to be happy when depressed, forgives when resentful, or supports when envious. The child will develop into a codependent who will ultimately become a great pretender. It is a curious phenomenon when you listen to a song hundreds of times but never really understand what the lyricist means to communicate. Such is evident in the following song lyrics, The Great Pretender. This song, which was one of my mother's favorites, is actually a very sad song about an adult who learned to act his way out of harm's way. Although, ostensibly, I guess, ostensibly, about a love affair, it could equally be describing a codependent raised by an emotional manipulator. The Great Pretender. So we'll, after I read this this song, I'll stop um, and then we'll continue tomorrow. Um, probably half because I'm going to get on. We're going to dance for 15 minutes. I'm probably going to do sound healing for at least 30 minutes. And then the last 15 minutes, I will do the um, human magic syndrome. So hopefully I get my bowl today. If not, then we'll definitely do sound healing on Friday. I'm so excited. Yes. Okay. Oh, oh, yes. I'm the great pretender. Pretending that I'm doing well, my need is such. I pretend to be, I pretend too much. I'm lonely, but no one can tell. Oh, oh yes, I'm the great pretender. Adrift in a world of my own. I've played the game, but to my real shame. You've left me to grieve all alone. Too real in this feeling of make-believe. Too real when I feel what my heart can't conceal. Yes, I'm the great pretender. Just laughing and gay like a clown. I seem to be what I'm not. You see, I'm wearing my heart like a crown, pretending that you're still around. <clears throat> okay, so we'll, I, we're, <clears throat> we're going to stop at surviving the narcissist creates codependency. Surviving the narcissist. Wow. Out of necessity, the pleasing and gifted child becomes an expert <clears throat> at delaying his need for gratification. He makes himself believe that compliments, affirmation, physical affection, or other important physical or emotional needs are conditionally tied to making his emotional manipulator artificially feel good about themselves. If this child, a future codependent, cannot embrace this twisted <clears throat> and unnatural realization, he may spend his childhood feeling disappointing and worthless. The child who cannot delay his gratification by bending his reality will likely experience anger, resentment, disappointment, and shame, all of which will be direct challenges to his physical or to his psychological survival. Such is the fate of the child who is to become an emotional manipulator. And another thing I wanted to say too, like when, <clears throat> damn, what was I about to say? When we hope, when people make mistakes, unintentionally and we hold on to that and we seek revenge or you know to make somebody pay for that 
that's emotional manipulation because we're all going to make mistakes, you know, even our children, you know, and, and I think just really, you know, teaching them the importance of their, that their emotions are valid, that we all make mistakes. And that doesn't change the way that I love you. That doesn't change the way that I love you, you know, and, um, not reacting to, not reacting to their triggers because our children are going to trigger us you know they're going to trigger us especially if you haven't done that healing work you know like like and then when they trigger us we got to realize that it's really our teenager okay i'm only can, can say this from my perspective everything that i do but i have a teenager she's 14 so if i react and i'm reacting from the space of the wounded teenager and myself you know what i'm saying so i have to really take a step back and react from the the healthy emotional parent. I can't react from the wounded teenager. <laughs> and that's why it's so important for us to go in and heal that child, heal that teen, that adolescent. You know, to really love ourselves the way that we needed or we wish that our parents would have loved us. So that is all for today. I am keeping my fingers crossed that I get my singing bowl today because I'm going to do some sound therapy tomorrow. We're going to do we're going to do some dancing therapy. We're going to do some sound therapy, and then we're going to end it with the rest. Of, we're going to continue reading Human Mag Magnet Syndrome until we um, are done with it. Um, but thank you all for being here today. I appreciate everybody who joined, who liked who um stayed um i appreciate y'all go out and have the most amazing day possible and i will see y'all back tomorrow at noon love y'all